So I have great pride and pleasure in introducing to you Jim Lair uh, to speak tonight, to give the Herb Black Lecture. All aboard, Jim. One time, Herb said to me, Jim, what's this bus thing all about? I hear you going, going around all the time calling buses on the PA system for trailways. What's that all about? And I explained part of the story that Haynes just told, and then, but I also went on to explain that later on, I went to a little junior college in Victoria, Texas, which is down on the on the Gulf Coast between Houston and Corpus Christi, where I worked eight hours a day as a ticket agent in the Trailways Bus Depot, and I said, Herb, it was there that it was the first time I was paid money to speak into a microphone. <laughs> and he said, mm. And I said, do you want me to demonstrate? And he said, sure. Well, here's what I did for Herb, and I'm going to do it for you. May I have your attention, please? This is your last call for Continental Trailways, 8.10 p.m. Silver Sides Air Conditioned Through Liner to Houston. Now leaving from Lane 1 for Inez at Nuganato, Louise, El Campo, Pierce, Wharton, Hungerford, Kenilton, Beasley, Rosenberg, Richmond, Sugarland, Stafford, Missouri, City, and Houston. All aboard! Don't forget your baggage, please. I did that for Herb's sake, <laughs> but also to demonstrate to Haynes how I progressed. <laughs> Started as a 12-year-old in the uh, doing little towns in Kansas, and went to went from there to little towns in uh, Texas, and now proved tonight, as I have many times doing this bus call, that if you learn something really early, and it's totally irrelevant, <laughs> you'll never forget it. But it's now it's become a deal that I figure out a way, and I just proved it. I figure out a way to do a bus call in every speech I make. <laughs> it's a good luck thing. It's like a good luck tie or one of those kind of things. Uh, so anyhow, I've done that. So now I can say what a pleasure it is to be with all of you here tonight. What an incredible honor it is to speak in anything that is named for Herb Block, or Herb Block. Herb Block, the individual, Herb Block, the piece of art, the cartoon that he put out most days. Uh, the a couple of things uh, I would like to say before I go any further, of course, is that Herb, the individual, and Herb Block, the cartoon's successor, Tom Tolls, is indeed a great successor to a great cartoonist. Tom deserves this award, and I am delighted he has gotten it today. <laughs> Kate, Kate and I met Tom when he was 12 years old, more or less, when he was a cartoonist for the Buffalo paper. He come because Meg Greenfield used to have these little gatherings, you remember, of editorial cartoonists, and every once in a while Meg would invite Kate and me to join her with you all, and it was wild, because you, all of you, all editorial cartoonists, are a little bit weird. And, uh, <laughs> and they, they do things like what Tom did. They put, uh, put things through their head, and uh, trust me, it's, he's, not, he, he's, he's one of a kind, but there are many... Uh, Many just like him. Um, <laughs> the thing about Herb as an individual on the personal side, because there was a Herb Block, the individual, and there was Herb Block, the cartoon. First time I met Herb Block, the individual, he was very, very nice to me. And I was stunned, because uh, trust me, I was absolutely nobody the first time I met the Herblock, who was really somebody. 
And then I realized, as I got to know him better and saw him in action with other people and whatever, that uh, her block, the individual, was nice to every person he ever dealt with, as one human being to another. And uh, professionally, of course, I knew him even better than I did personally, and so did everybody else who read the Washington Post. If I had a nickel for every time, I laughed out loud early in the morning at a her block, I would be much wealthier than I am as a result of spending my life in non-commercial television. <laughs> Two characteristics of her block are at work with me here tonight, influencing at least what I plan to do the next few minutes. Brevity was one of Herb's middle names. He spoke quickly and he spoke briefly, and it was also, of course, the hallmark of his cartoons. A picture in a few words said, oh, so much more than sometimes, as the cliche goes, a million words, a million pictures, and a whole lot of music and all the rest can do. So in Herb's honor, I will not keep you long. And if we have time, I will be delighted. I was asked if I would take questions at the end. I'll be delighted to do that. Let me give you your guidelines. So as you think while I'm speaking of a question or a comment, my guidelines are as follows. I am not a pundit, and I do not handle criticism well. <laughs> so keep that in mind as you form your questions. Second thing about Herb uh, that struck me and strikes me for tonight is that Herb did not strike me as the lecture type. Somebody who liked to be lectured or somebody who probably enjoyed other people lecturing. So I, my f few remarks, uh, I would like for you to think of them as a few remarks rather than as a lecture. And my few remarks have to do with what most of us in this room are dealing with all the time as we speak. And that is in the information revolutions that are currently going on here and throughout the world. When I say revolutions, I mean S plural. Just look, for instance, at what's happening in the, in the Arab world, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, Oman, Bahrain, Syria. These are all revolutions happening or in the process or prospect of happening. Each country and situation is unique, of course, but there are some connecting factors among them. The main one, in my opinion, of course, and everybody's opinion, is a desire of the people to live in a free and open society and environment, to have the possibility, the real possibility of their dreams being realized and of course their children being educated. But there is another connection and each one of those revolutions there has been, in each one of those revolutions in all of those countries and elsewhere, there has been the additional revolution of the dissemination of real and accurate information to the people in those countries for the first time ever. Some of it is by old-fashioned means, in print, radio, television, ra uh, uh, whatever, but much of it is, is being done with some of these little revolutionary gadgets that we all have now. These little, what, Twitter tweets and iPods and, and uh, droids and all that kind of stuff. It is uh, Facebook. Uh, I, know, I know the names of every one of them. <laughs> I even use some of them. It would not be correct, in my opinion at least, to claim that the information revolutions were the sole cause of the real people and political revolutions. But there is no question in my mind that the they made important contributions. In other words, the, the information revolutions in each one of those countries uh, led to the real people and the political revolutions in some way. They at least contributed to them. There's no question, for instance, that the people in Egypt acted on information that they had seen and heard about what had, happened, what had just happened in Tunisia. And the Libyans now know about Egypt as well, and Tunisia. And so do the people in uh, 
name the next country and the next country and the next country. And everybody begins to think, hey, wait a minute. If that can happen there, why can't it happen here? And a lot of, and, and that is what, that is the world in which we all live, and it doesn't matter what part of the world you live in at this moment, we are all caught up one way or another, positively or negatively, in the various information revolutions. And it will, will it ever stop? I don't think so. I don't think we even have an idea that we're probably still even in the beginning of the information revolution, some of the information revolutions, and what the impact of those various kinds of revolutions will be. Here in the United States, the freest and most open nation of the world, there are all kinds and sizes of information revolutions, fully blooming, just beginning, or just around the corner. At the ordinary citizen level, these little machines, see? See how cool I am? See how hip I am? <laughs> Anyhow, those little things, have, I have access, and so does anybody who has them, to just about every fact or little fact that you would want, including everything like our ages, our birthplaces, what our music and travel preferences are, the directions to the nearest Tex-Mex restaurant, what number to call to make a reservation, headlines, detailed news and feature stories as well from thousands of publications and books about literally every subject imaginable and most every language imaginable. It is no exaggeration to say, as many experts are now saying, America and many other parts of the world are literally being drowned by a flood of information. Good information, bad information, harmful information, helpful information, informative information, useless information. You can find ways to make a bomb. You can find ways to disarm a bomb. You can find ways to get high or to get low, to get fat or get skinny, get well or get dead, and most anything else in between, above or below. All of us, literally all of us, in this room and all other rooms, must now live with one of the major new realities that has come from the information floods and revolutions. And that, of course, is the disappearance of privacy, most likely forever. You dare write something malicious, salacious, or simply stupid or embarrassing in an email, to a colleague, friend, or stranger, be prepared to have it eventually shared with somebody, maybe all kinds of somebodies. That includes secrets, private secrets, public secrets, military, national security secrets, intelligence secrets, artistic secrets, business secrets, whatever kind of secrets there are. Not just in emails, but through various other electronic and technological means. Documents once sealed, for whatever reasons initially, are more commonly unsealed than ever before, because, now, before, because of another whole set of reasons. In other words, they were sealed for reasons that existed at the time, considered legitimate, unsealed now, for a whole different set of reasons, now considered legitimate. Get used to it. The public's right to know is a growingly fierce force in all of the world. And I mean among all kinds of people, not just those in the so-called world of celebrities. That applies doubly, of course, even in of celebrities, even in cases such as Charlie Sheen, when nobody wants to know one single thing more about Charlie Sheen. But there it is out there to know anyhow, like it or not. In short, privacy, as I say, as most of us have come to think of it, is over. All we can do now is get used to it, beware of it, and adjust to it. Adjust to it. That may be what all of us, each in our own, own way, has to do with many of the information revolutions and its many forms. And the top of that list, of course, are those of us who do what Herb did so well for so long, what Tom still does, 
and what a lot of these, a lot of you in this room still do, which is have anything at all to do with journalism and the news business. At the heart of our democratic society is the information the voters need to decide whom to put in charge of the government of the country, as well as our respective states, counties, cities, school districts, water districts, precincts, whatevers. Thomas Jefferson, you may have heard of him. He used to hang out around here. He told his fellow founders that without an informed electorate, this thing we are creating called a democratic society will not work. And that, of course, is where all of us come in. All of us meaning the folks I was just talking about. It is the specific job and purpose of journalism to provide the information and the commentary and the analysis that is required for becoming informed. And within journalism, there is a revolution of its own going on in a major way, as some of you may have already noticed. I'm in the middle of it, along with many, many people in this room. And I, nobody needs to tell me or anybody else that just watch what happened to Hosni Mubarak and Muammar Gaddafi, and you know that being in the middle of a revolution is not always fun. And that is true of the revolution going underway right now in our world of journalism. The noises we are all hearing from newsrooms and often from boardrooms nearby are screams of panic, newspaper circulation and profits are down, so are the ratings of nightly news programs, sound the alarms, cable news and the internet bloggers and the satellite and other radio talk sh shouters and the late night comedians are teaming up with yahoos and googles and ipods and mp3 players and other strange things to put us out of business but as i have told more than one gathering of my fellow and sister journalists lately i believe to coin a phrase i believe we may have mostly fear itself to fear i think we need to look at a few critical basics the bloggers are talkers commentators, not reporters. The talk show hosts are reactors, commentators, not reporters. The comedians are entertainers, commentators, not reporters. The search engines search, but they do not report. The iPods and MP3s and droids are mere machines, as are cable television and satellite radio. All of them, every single one of them, have to have the news to exist, to thrive, or to put it another way in the beginning, there must always be the news. David Letterman tells a joke about Scott Walker or Scott Brown. Nobody's going to laugh if they don't know about Wisconsin or Massachusetts politics. John Stewart reports a made-up news story about something called collective bargaining rights for public employees. Nobody's going to get it unless they know about Wisconsin or Ohio. A blogger or a radio talker comes unglued about an air tanker contract or a wild man from Tripoli or something called a continuing resolution or a debt ceiling. They and their varied readers or listeners have to know what the fuss is all about or they're simply not going to get it. And whatever the route it may travel to the blogger, the screamer, the comedian, the cable TV opinionator, the search engine, the whatever, it has to start with one of us real people, one of us boring reporters, one of us journalists who was there, who read the original document, who got the original leak, who did the original interview, who did whatever it took to make it news in the first place and thus bring it to the attention of all others in the information and reaction food chain and make it part of the ever-growing flood of information. And it's not only about our reporting. There is also evidence that the role of the news gatekeeper is not only not going away, it's coming back big time. It's all because of the flood, the increasing amount of news noise and no noise about the news out there in the blogosphere and the satellite and iPod and all other spheres. People are busy. They want some professional, unbiased, unagenda assistance in sorting through it all to help determine what is important and what is not so important before they go off to an editorial page 
or the commentators or to be shouted at or entertained about. That is what we journalists have always done. There is no question that the nature, the machinery, and certainly the looks of the gatekeepers must change. But like it or not, for instance, there will always be a need for animals like television anchors who announce the end result of the story sorting. They just won't be mostly old white men anymore. The major problem we mainstream gatekeepers have now is the loss of, a, of the substantial credibility and trust that it takes to do our work effectively. Our arrogance, among other things, has gotten in the way. That's fixable. All of it is. I happen to believe there's nothing wrong with the basic practice of journalism in America today that a little humility and a lot of professionalism and mostly transparency could not cure, along with the realization or re-realization that journalism is still about the story. Newspaper owners and network executives and Wall Street financiers must be in on it as well because it may mean leaving the huge profits to the search engines as well as the shouting to the shouters and the entertaining to the clowns. I would add a small PS to this, and some of you may disagree with me. Feel free to not do so. <laughs> if there was ever a perfect example of what professional journalism is and does, I believe the case of WikiLeaks and its leaked documents are it, big time. Whatever anybody thinks about the legality and the propriety of the leaking itself. It was not until those thousands and thousands and thousands of documents were read, culled, sorted, and processed by professional journalists that they had any real meaning, positively or negatively. Very few ordinary citizens of any country were ever going to take the time to read all of that raw data and decide on their own what it meant or didn't mean or decide if it was important or mostly meaningless gossip. In a gigantic, very public way, the public was able to see what the basic function of serious journalism really is. Watch, observe, read, sort, edit, present, and let the readers, the listeners, the voters, the citizens decide what to make of it all, finally. And thus, and it's a very big thus, I'll admit, we, the boring ones of journalism, must keep our eyes on the ball. We must not stray from some of the basics that make us unique from all the others by going with stories before they're not quite ready, spicing them up with a bit of over-the-line commentary, by raising the volume, and worst of all, making entertaining people one of our purposes. You want to be entertained? For God's sake, go to the circus. Don't watch the news hour, please. I tell people all that, all that all the time, and I mean it. I never want me to be confused with the clowns. And besides, by sticking to our journalistic guns, all of us in the serious journalism business, at any level, at any, well, I mean locally, regionally, nationally, internationally, whether you're in the straight reporting part of journalism or in the analytical side of journalism or the opinion part of journalism, if we stick to our guns, we'll have the non-clown non-shout, prostrate straight reporting field of journalism all to ourselves, if we, to coin another phrase, stay the course. For the record, finally, I would like for you to know, but some of you may have already been told, but I'm going to tell you again, we at the PBS NewsHour do have a course to follow. A few years ago, I was asked at a seminar in Aspen if I had any personal guidelines that I used, that we used in, uh, in producing the news hour every day, journalism guidelines and practice the way we practice journalism. And if so, I wasn't the only one asked, but I was asked if I would mind sharing them. And I said no, and here in part is what I sent. These are my guideline, guidelines for practicing journalism and the guidelines we use at the news hour. Do nothing I cannot defend cover, write, and present every story with the care I would want if the story were about me. Assume there is at least one other side or version to every story. Assume the viewer is as smart and as caring and as good a person as I am. Assume the same about all people on whom I report. Assume personal lives are a private matter 
until a legitimate turn in the story absolutely mandates otherwise. Carefully separate opinion and analysis from straight news stories and clearly label everything. Do not use anonymous sources or blind quotes except on rare and monumental occasions. No one should ever be allowed to attack another anonymously. And finally, I am not in the entertainment business. Those are our guidelines. Now, your questions and comments. Thank you. Well, there are none. I see Mike Gettler here. He's just not allowed to ask any. In the back, back, back row. Might be a kind of simplistic question, but it seems like so much of the news is bad all the time. Is there any reason you can't report on more of the good stuff happening in the world? Say that again, please. I didn't hear you. Um, can you... The, Would you take the mic away from you a little okay, bit? Okay, I'm not used to this. Okay, it seems it like a lot of the news in the world is bad, bad stuff, but I know there's a lot of great stuff going on in the world. How come people don't report on that more? On what kind of stuff in the world? Oh, good stuff. Why don't they report? Well, they, there's a lot of reporting on good stuff. Just remember that uh, the definition of news goes back to dog bites man. It's not news. Man bites dog is man, is news. The idea of uh, the way the standard re retort is that 1,500 cars go down 395 and then on an accident, and car number 1,501 has an accident, that's news, out of the ordinary. The assumption that journalism makes that is that most people are good people, that they're well motivated, just people in politics, as well as the rest of the world, teachers, even journalists, are well motivated people who are honest and are trying to do their best. And the people who are, are working at most jobs are honest and trying to do their best. People who are raising children or are a child are trying to get up or down or help another, another person in doing their best. So, the fact that, that this is happening, that good things are happening the way they're supposed to, is if you wrote, if you spent a lot of time doing, covering that, that's all you would cover and you would tell people what they already know and expect. I'm not necessarily defending not having, we do, we, we on the news, I speak, all I do is speak for the news hour. Uh, we, we have good news stories, I guess what you would call them, but we don't call them good news stories. There was a time several years ago, many years ago, when somebody complained in this form to a president of a, of a network that should remain nameless, said to the, to the president of his news division, we've got, we've got to have more good news on our newscast. People are, are all upset. And the, and the, exec, uh, the uh, president of the news division said, well, that's because the news is, can be really upsetting sometimes. You know, bad things happen. And he said, well, people don't want to be upset watching the news. And this guy argued, we're not in the upset business. We're not in the, in the, in the non-upset business. We're just in the business of reporting what happened. Uh, but I hear your point, and I've, I've talked too long about it already. But uh, I, I hear what you're saying, finally. Yes, sir. I, I share what I take to be your basic optimism that the new media are sorting out in the marketplace. As I look at the policy world I live in, I think if you were to survey policymakers in town and, and, and analysts and so forth, there'd be a very tight convergence on which blogs you go to for which reason. So the marketplace works. What worries you most about how this new info environment is evolving? Worries you in terms of its potential downside impact on the functioning of the republic? Well, it's a good question. What worries me the most is that there's so much information, the flood that I talked about, that, that, that people are, and, and, and the, 
and some news organizations are are going with going with uh, they're, they're not necessarily going with the flood, but they're just kind of washing their hands of the flood. In other words, they're just they're they're they are they're they're not doing the sorting process, the 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 judgment. All journalism is judgment. I mean, I. I uh, uh, Haynes said, were you city editor of the Times Herald? Yes. And one day, after a really horrendous, I was a cheap newspaper, not a very good newspaper. It was an afternoon paper. It was in the 1960s, uh, uh, 70s. And I, I would work from 5 in the morning to 7 in the evening. And I, we had seven editions. And we had, and 90% of the time, all the reporters were covering luncheon speeches that the publisher's wife wanted covered. So it was, it was hellacious. Uh, but uh, but I one day I, I, I thought I went thought back and how many decisions did I make between this five a five between five a.m. and seven p.m. or something like that on a given day and I figured I made 150 decisions cover this story don't cover that story throw that story away this throw this one on page one you know et cetera because after every one story that goes in the paper 1,500 of them are on the floor. And that process is called journalism, and uh, and 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 those judgments need to be made. And what worries me, uh, you asked to answer you. Uh, Robert McNeil used to say, "Larry, if you were ever a guest on our program, we never have you back because your answers are so damn long." <laughs> but at any rate, back to your question. The the um, the 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 the. the I'm, what worries me that the, that what is perceived to be news. What is decided by the news, the, by the, the judgment, the gatekeepers uh, of all levels, uh, they also, there are an awful lot of dog stories that are not news. And that takes three or four minutes. They could be devoted to an in, a, 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 a different kind of piece about, uh, about what we're going to do about Medicare reform or what we're going to do about this and that. I'm not saying that everything needs to be serious. And everything needs to be, and serious necessarily means boring. I said one time, somebody said, well, you and McNeil have the courage to be serious, and that's terrific. And somebody said, well, you also have the courage to be boring. That's even more terrific. <laughs> it takes more courage, at least. The, um, the, but the, the thing that worries me, worries me the most, that if we don't get, our, get a handle on this information flood and, 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 start, and, and, and develop new aggregations or new ways to put it all together that, that involve literally everybody of all ages and all tastes. So that, there, that not everybody wants to read a, a hold, hold a daily newspaper in their hand anymore. We know that. Not everybody wants to hold a magazine. Not everybody wants to sit in front of a television set and watch a, a television program that goes on at a certain time and goes off at a certain time. The way people get information is, is changed and it's changed forever.